that class where I learned about climate as like storytelling. I think sometimes we need to travel to somewhere else to realize where we should be in life. Our passion will always guide us back. Eli Mitchell Larson, a leading voice in the climate tech space and co-founder of Carbon Gap. Eli is not only a climate researcher at the University of Oxford, but also a driving force behind Europe's push for rigorous carbon removal practices. We do need an organization who has an organizing principle of all forms of carbon dioxide removal are carbon dioxide removal. I think it, it was really clear to me that we needed to think about climate change as this dual process of reducing emissions and also scaling up carbon removal. They put $500 billion towards climate. Policies need a hook, they need a rationale for a policymaker to be interested. They need a window of opportunity yeah. and they need champions. But I realized that a lot of working in climate is communicating. Yes. As you know, yeah. better than most. From advising Fortune 500 companies to shaping policies that aim for net zero and beyond, Eli's work is at the forefront of global efforts to make our planet a healthier place for future generations. So today on the show, I have the co-founder of Carbon Gap, Eli here. Hi Lydia, Eli Mitchell Larson here. Nice to meet you all. I'm so happy to have him because we're working in the same industry. We're trying to remove more CO2 from the atmosphere. Absolutely. And then we met each other in an event and I was like, come on to the show. And also, he fit into my Escape 9 to 5 podcast. He used to work in a traditional industry um, and then he switched. And now we are going to do the true truth and the lie with the twist, your escape 9 to 5 journey. Tell me. One, in my first job, while we were riding around in the forest that our company owned, we had to be armed. We had to have weapons in case we ran into some sort of unsavory illegal weed growers who lived on the property. <laughs> I once got stuck in a traffic jam and missed my flight on the way back from COP because Rishi Sunak had just arrived and he was clogging up the, all of the uh, roads in and out. Yeah. Um, and third, I got into a kind of public debate with Cristiana Figueres. She was the head of the climate I read the book. negotiation pro Yes, um, about whether or when I would have to stop burning coal to heat my houseboat. Mm. So convince Cristiana that we don't need to burn the coal? Absolutely not, but I was living on a canal narrowboat, which is this funny thing in, that they have in the UK with these long narrow boats, oh, houseboats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you heat them with coal, which is terrible because yeah. I'm an environmentalist, I'm working in carbon removal, yeah. and here I am like staying, staying alive in the winter, burning these little lumps of coal, okay. and somehow I brought that up in my question to her as a kind of uh, icebreaker, but she pounced. She went into negotiation mode. She was like, ah, you need to stop burning coal now, like when are you going to stop? Is it going to be... April or May. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that's the truth. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I gave too many details. <laughs> too many details. Yeah. I would say uh, the second one is a lie. Maybe it's a different politician, a different cop. Yeah, it, it wasn't a detailed enough lie, and <laughs> there's nothing else to it. Okay. I don't even think Rishi Sunak was there at the same time I was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Tell me more about the first one, really interesting. Yeah, so my first uh, job out of undergrad was a nine to five, which I think is why maybe, hopefully, I, I have something to offer in this podcast. But it was an impact investing firm. And one thing we did was we bought timberland, like large scale a Redwood Douglas for thousands yeah. of acres of timberland. And we'd have to go survey the property and drive around. Yeah. But in these days, and maybe even still today, this was like the capital of illegal weed growing in the US. They call it the Emerald Triangle up oh, in Northern California. Okay. And so there's all these people that are kind of squatting, living in these strange little clearings in the woods, growing weed illegally, including on some of the properties that our company owned. Uh -huh. So I'd be with the forester driving around and he would have a gun in case things went sideways and I was completely naive to this. I wouldn't have known what to do. But he kind of knew these foresters and it was interesting that he, you know, befriended, he befriended them and he was sort of able to operate oh, inside of okay. that strange slice of society. Yeah. But it was very weird. I'm working for a, you know, investment firm in San Francisco and I I'm going off on work trips to like drive around in the forest on ATVs and <laughs> it was really interesting, you know. Yeah, I think one thing that I found it very interesting is no matter who I interview for my podcast, because Escape 9 to 5 is basically my excuse to interview people who are ahead of me in this Escape 9 to 5 journey, but everyone has a good story to tell. 
from their past life in the traditional mm -hmm. industry. So if we move on to the next part is why then? You do you have like an aha moment when you want to switch to the more like not nine to five life? Yeah, I was really young. I was living in San Francisco. I was working for this investment firm. It was a bit unconventional in the sense that it was called New Island Capital and it was an impact yeah. investment firm. Yeah. So it was over, it was, I think it was the largest in the world at the time. So I learned a lot of the conventional investing skills and it kind of was a nine to five or maybe more actually. Um, but I think I found, I somehow felt that life in San Francisco was too comfortable, which I now look back on and I'm like, what was I doing? Why didn't I just stay there and, exactly. and keep working in that industry? <laughs> but I think it was the kind of, the strange feeling of like, you know, the world is in trouble. Climate change is, you know, a terrible, terrible threat that we're facing. And life in San Francisco, the quality of life was so nice. Everybody was working in these very lucrative careers in tech. Yeah. And I started to feel like I wasn't really relating to people or connecting to people. And I felt like I needed to do something where I felt closer to the impact. What I think I've learned over the years, though, is like you can be working at an investment firm or a philanthropy or some some role where you have huge impact, but you don't really feel it because no. you don't get to see the, the fruits of your labor. You don't get to participate. Yeah in mobilizing those funds yeah. but I was young and I felt like ah like I'm, I keep building these financial models and you know pressing send on the check <laughs> but I don't feel like I'm doing anything yeah. so I, I left and joined a small um, off-grid solar company called Sun Farmer mm -hmm. where we, we worked in uh, predominantly Nepal to build off-grid solar installations so what when there was no connection to the grid I think there were a lot of companies trying to do off-grid solar in those days mostly in East Africa no one else was doing it in Nepal I guess we then learned why <laughs> It's a really difficult uh, <laughs> environment to operate in. But, you know, there, there was in Nepal at the time, and I think still today, significant numbers of people with no connection to the electrical grid. Yeah. So farmers would be powering their water pumps with little diesel generators. Right. They wouldn't ha be able to charge their phone in their house. There's all kinds of health risks that, that pile up as well mm -hmm. when you don't have access to solid energy. Even in, in the capital, in Kathmandu, they had what's called load shedding, so rolling okay. blackouts. In Nepal at the time, everyone had an app on their phone which would tell you which hours of the day you would have electricity oh. and people had to plan their whole lives around it oh I can do laundry at 4 a.m. and I can cook at this hour so it's very difficult and we were trying to come up with a sort of scalable financeable solar product that could change that what, what happened at the end um, so it was a really strange organizational setup where it was a US not-for-profit and a Nepali for-profit so okay. we were kind of getting low-risk capital that could be deployed into Nepal. Uh -huh. And what we ended up doing was fully transitioning it over to local management. So we had a fantastic local CEO, Avishek Mala, who had deep experience in like Humla province, like really remote parts of Nepal. He basically took over the organization. Myself and, and the founder, Andy Moon, um, became board members and then gradually kind of drifted away. So it, it's still there. Some farmers still operating in Kathmandu. That's great. Uh, yeah. How many times have you been to Nepal then? To I think I probably spent a collective maybe year there over three years so probably like four or five times yeah that's so cool i've never been to nepal wild place <laughs> incredible place beautiful place yeah. so complex so difficult to really get a handle on and yeah. i was just scratching the surface and you know it was interesting because i would go with my nepali colleagues to the terai region in the south which is not what you think of when you think of nepal you think of big Mountain, himalayan yeah, mountains yeah, yeah, and yeah. the the southern terai region is flat hot a lot like uttar pradesh on the other side of the border uh -huh. um, and it was interesting because you know i'm a complete fish out of water i don't speak hardly any of the language i'm attempting to work with our partners through it through translation but my colleagues from Kathmandu were also almost just as this foreign is. in that oh. region like that's that's the thing about Nepal is it's, it's so fragmented it's so complex there's so many different ethnicities and oh. religions and it's yeah it's quite a fascinating country and then that's uh, after that you found that carbon gap I guess we can talk about it in the next segment but I'm really interested in knowing some of the biggest challenges while you're transitioning from nine to five job to doing these non-profit for-profit ventures yeah well maybe it would be interesting to think about the transition after sun farmers i started working for a tech company in 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 fashion actually briefly completely off the off the in, in a different trajectory and then i was truly about to become a real nine to fiver yeah and then i had this opportunity to come to the university of oxford right. uh, which is why we're here in yeah, the uk yeah. talking yeah. together yeah. and that was probably the moment where i took a, a leap or a, where I felt like, you know, I, I'm used to having a job, you know, having a, an identity based around a job. And now I'm going to do 
something a little risky. I'm gonna kind of enter the Oxford research ecosystem and, and try to figure out what's next. And so that was probably the pivot where in, an, in a parallel universe, I'm like an operations guy at a peer-to-peer -peer online marketplace, oh, okay. which seems impossible to imagine. Yeah. But here I am like fully invested in climate, which was kind of what I was doing my whole career. I just hadn't had the sort of 100% uh, commitment to say, this is what I'm doing. As long as I live, whatever I'm doing, it's going to be in climate. Yeah, that's what I might epiphany as well like since 2017 i have this idea that i want to do something in climate because i went to this forum called one young world in colombia oh. everyone is talking about sustainable development goals which i'm just you know trying to help whoever gave the money across the door and then i got the opportunity to join this climate tech coverage team then last year i left the team but then i realized my identity as a climate person wouldn't change which is has led me to a lot of my other mm. things and making an impact wouldn't change as well yeah it's like yeah. i think we have so many possibilities and we're so fortunate to have so many op yes. opportunities and yes. way directions we could go yes. so it's nice to fix one thing in place yeah it's nice just to say hmm, i might work in tech i might work in investing i might you know become a researcher but it will be i, I know it will be in climate so i yeah. think sometimes limiting the universe of possibilities for yourself in a way that's honest and aligned with what you want to do is so it's so important because comforting. so we talked about your diverse background then and, and then you move to oxford is that then you realize you want to be a climate person is, do you have a moment a day that you still remember <laughs> i think that really it's always easy to look back at your life and career and draw the red line that makes it all make sense. Yeah. But it is true that at every stage I was doing climate. In other words, I started in undergrad as a geochemist. I was working on paleoclimates, which was a very What's arcane. That? It's basically studying ancient climate change long before humans existed uh -huh. and trying to use these clues in the geological record to reconstruct what was the temperature, what was the salinity. And that's basically the data that we use to contextualize why this cl current <laughs> climate change is so bad because yeah. we can I compare it why. to exactly we can compare it to that, what actually happened so that was my original discipline yeah. and then I worked in investing but it was aligned with climate then I did the off-grid solar when I came to Oxford um, it was through the generosity of this program called the Pershing Square Scholarship it's a um, initiative by Bill Ackman in New York oh, City okay. and basically it, it fully funds this two years at Oxford to kind of explore via a master's degree and an MBA uh -huh. a kind of topic that you want to, to take to the next level so for me that was that was coming back to climate um, and it was at Oxford that I met Miles Allen and, and other scientists in the kind of Oxford Net Zero community who really exposed me to the kind of concept of carbon management, the idea of like moving physical flows of carbon around, not just reducing emissions per se or electrifying the grid. So was there a pivotal moment? Honestly, it was probably way back in undergrad when I was like 20. Uh -huh. I walked into this class called Organic Geochemistry. Yeah. Sounds really boring and yeah, yeah I, like <laughs> I, I don't know what compelled me to check that out but I came in the class there was only two other people uh, there were three of us that's great and this yeah, this guy heard. walked in the room <laughs> barefoot yeah and just started like talking like he didn't even really introduce himself he just started like talking about you know how ancient uh, oxygen emitting bacteria kind of like hacked the atmosphere to to totally change it and, and uh, almost just like storytelling and uh -huh. the guy was Mark Pagani he was an incredible scientist incredible paleoclimatologist and I think that class where I learned about climate as like storytelling uh -huh. like the stories of ancient shifts in the climate system and just how that relies on understanding biology physics all these different disciplines kind of coming together I just suddenly found it so fun and so intellectually engaging that I think I was then and there converted to be a lifelong climate person even if I didn't kind of re-remember or rediscover that fact until I came back to Oxford and, and was back in academia yeah. a little bit. I think sometimes we need to travel to somewhere else to realize where we should be in life. Our passion will always guide us back, like unintentionally even sometimes. So do you have unexpected skills that you brought to whatever that you're doing now as a climate person from your previous life? I think that geochemistry and, and well really any natural sciences background but especially geology where you have to kind of think about for example the long-term carbon cycle okay it's calcium and other ions in the river system reaching the ocean being incorporated into the shells of organisms they they rain down to the bottom of the ocean they build up the tectonic plate slowly moves that material into the mantle like what like it's just mind-blowing that all those systems are connected and then it comes back through volcanism 
metabolism. Like that's the long-term carbon cycle. To understand mm -hmm. it, you it's relatively straightforward, but it's all these different pieces from other sciences. Geology, really, I'm biased, but <laughs> I think I love that the kind of interconnectedness of it. It's not a pure science, you know, like math, maths, or physics. Yeah. It's it's really drawing on all different disciplines, but that's kind of what I love about it. I love to be able to just pull from all those different pieces. So things that I learned about way back in the day about, you know, the calcium compensation depth, like essentially, you know, based on the acidity of the water, uh, at what point can organisms successfully incorporate calcium into their shells, like shellfish and, right. and, and plankton, that, uh, coccolithophores, organisms that kind of build shells themselves. from calcium carbonate themselves. Uh -huh. Like that's relevant now that we have such strong evidence of ocean acidification and yeah. people trying to do ocean alkalinization. Yeah, 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 yeah. So stuff that, you know, ordinarily the stuff you learn in your undergrad. And I think the other thing that maybe helped me surprisingly was in my younger years, I was a singer. I did a lot of vocal mm -hmm. performance in like acapella groups and choirs and yeah, yeah. these kinds of things. And I was kind of sad that I stopped doing that as much, but I realized that a lot of working in climate is communicating, Yes, as you know, yeah. better than most yeah. and, and speaking. And so I've had a lot of chances to, to speak and, and try to get people excited or engaged on climate. And I realized that that kind of comfort with performing or mm -hmm. not always comfort, but just experience trying to kind of connect with people and reach people yeah. was sort of repurposable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I kind of feel like talking about c climate, it also needs to be fun. You want to be on something that's big, make an impact, but also hopeful and fun. So then is that something that brought you to Carbon Gap? How did you start? Yeah, so at Oxford, I was kind of reintroduced to the idea of carbon capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal mm -hmm. as both very important, but also very distinct yes, yes. processes. I was part of a team that um, wrote this piece called the Oxford Offsetting Principles, which, which kind of helped establish this dichotomy between emission reductions on the one hand and carbon removal on the other. Oh, you trying part to, of the team. Yeah, yeah. So that was an amazing opportunity that thanks to Miles and Steve Smith and others at Oxford, I was able to be essentially the lead drafter. So it was my job as a, as a master student <laughs> to herd all the cats. And these are some <laughs> big, big deals. Like Yadvinder Malhi is a yeah. fellow of the Royal Society. Yeah. So I'm on the phone, like calling them up, almost negotiating because there's such a diversity of authors on that piece. Yeah. With a piece like that, it's not so much about, you know, doing a piece of research and getting the right answer. It's about getting agreement and consensus among a group of people. The discussion. Exactly. And in that group, there were people that had spent their lives researching and, and thinking about forests and how to, yeah. you know, scale yeah. forestry. And yeah, there's yeah. people that had spent their life focusing on carbon capture and storage uh -huh. and how to, how to fill up geological reservoirs with CO2. And those almost polar opposite disciplines in some ways struggled to come to a consensus, but we ultimately did. And through that piece, I think it, it was really clear to me that we needed to think about climate change as this dual process of reducing emissions and also scaling up carbon removal. Yeah. There's uh, a gentleman named Noah Deitch who now works at the Department of Energy in the U.S. leading a lot of the carbon removal work, but he had co-founded an NGO called Carbon 180. Yeah. And, and essentially, he inspired me because they had successfully built uh, a not-for-profit, an NGO, all about carbon dioxide removal in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so he then introduced me to some other folks here who were already thinking of building a, a similar organization in Europe. Okay. And it took some time because I think for a while I was focused more on the sort of permanent carbon storage side rather than all forms of carbon removal, including, you know, plants and, <laughs> yes. and soil carbon. In fact, I had some experience in that from my forestry yeah. work yeah, in, in my first job, but yeah. I had sort of felt that I had pivoted more towards the geological storage mm -hmm. realm. So it took some time and, dis and debates with the other co-founders until I kind of came to the realization, wow, we do need an organization who has an organizing principle of all forms of carbon dioxide removal are carbon dioxide removal. They're, yes. they're all needed. Yes. And we need to be a champion for making sure that the best scientific expertise is coming into the policymaking process. Okay. So the policies aren't just being made willy-nilly. We actually have the voice of the research community and the expert community. I was persuaded by first by NOAA in the US and then by uh, some of the other folks who were uh, getting it off the ground. That's amazing. It feels like your life is paving the way for you to be at this point in your life, and which is w what we need as well in the society for enough 
scientific research to come into play and to raise the awareness for people. I sort of understand what Carbon Gap is doing, but what I first came across Carbon Gap is I was just doing research about all the different pathways. And then I understand you have all of those information. But if you can tell us a little bit more about when you founded it, what, what's the vision and now you're, what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So the, we launched Carbon Gap to be the first independent NGO, not-for-profit, that focuses only on carbon dioxide removal. And that's not because we think carbon dioxide removal is more important than emission reductions or renewables. Far from it. It's, yeah. a, it's a small complement, really. Yeah. Um, but our insight was, and this was really inspired by Carbon 180 in the U.S., you need an organization that's doing this that's 100% funded by philanthropy. So yeah. there's, they're not funded by industry. They're not kind of a, an agent of the tech sector who's, who's maybe pushing this agenda. Rather, they have the independence to sort of look at the climate problem in a really sober and thoughtful way and say, are we going to need removals? Yes, quite a lot. Why will we need them? Okay, in these very specific uh, safe use cases. And now that's not just going to happen. We need to push government to make it happen. Mm -hmm. We don't have cheap solar because, you know, we put sol solar panels on the Voyager spacecraft. That was the beginning. We needed governments to pour yes. money into yes. this stuff. The awareness for the public is what would drive the interest from the government and especially what you're doing for the scientific research from an independent standpoint. Mm. That would really, really help the government to make the decision. I realize you're doing some really innovative work. Some, there's a concept called carbon take back obligation. Mm. What, what is this? <laughs> yeah, so actually carbon take back, take back obligation isn't so much an initiative of Carbon Gap, and, yeah. uh, but it, it's kind of my previous life. So before I got together with the other co-founders of Carbon Gap and, and launched Carbon Gap, my introduction to policy work, because I was not a policy person. I, did, I don't think as a no. member of the startup community or, the, or even <laughs> research community, yeah, it's it, it's such a hard thing to imagine. Like, wait a minute. Policy, but, what is that? Yeah, but I'm ha I'll, I'll do my best to explain <laughs> what it is. I, every single thing that happens in our society from, you know, yeah. the import of coffee to, you know, the sourcing of the products in our yeah. phones. It's not a free market. It's a carefully architected and regulated system. There are rules for everything. Yes. And most startup entrepreneurs, understandably so, they say, how can I basically play the game according to the rules that already exist? Because I don't have time to try to change the rules. I, got, I have an idea. I yeah. want to launch it. Yeah. But I think I learned through the carbon take-back obligation that you actually can, like, people more than they think can change the rules. So this policy concept came from Professor Miles Allen at Oxford, and uh, it's called the Carbon Take Back Obligation. Actually, we coined that name. It had another name originally, but um, I joined with him and others to kind of build this proposal. And the idea is to say, most of our climate policies apply to us, the individual. Or yes. th they say, okay, you have to pay a carbon tax, or you have to pay an extra fuel surcharge. Uh, they're, they're, let's say, demand side rather than supply side policies. They, they basically say, you, the emitter, you, the person driving a car, you are responsible for climate change. Carbon take-back obligation says, let's put an obligation at the at the wellhead where the oil and gas is being extracted. Mm -hmm. Let's basically say, if you want to either extract hydrocarbons from the earth or import them into this given region, you will now carry with you an obligation to store a certain amount of CO2. Oh. It's it's this idea of extended producer responsibility, yeah. which is a term that's used in like a lot of like car tires often, like when they make car tires mm -hmm. they've got they're responsible for the disposal costs of the car tires yeah, yeah. and this is the same idea it's basically saying uh, each year the oil and gas industry will be required to store a little bit more carbon and now all of a sudden in, in today's world nobody really has an incentive to store co2 geologically no it's expensive it's it's still relatively unknown to the general public so there's yeah, often resistance yeah. the carbon take back obligation totally changes that because it basically says here's a large industry who needs raw co2 to store simply to remain in compliance so they can even sell their products. Oh. So you're basically saying the only people that are allowed to sell oil and gas in the UK are companies that have met this obligation, okay. just like we do in lots of industries. So yeah. it's a really clever idea. It, of course, is quite simple because it ends up regulating a small number of oil majors mm -hmm. rather than every single person with a car. Yeah, yeah. But like any policy, and this is, I think, what I learned in my kind of trial by fire into the policy world, you can have a brilliant idea, idea. <laughs> but policies need a hook they need a rationale for a policymaker to be interested they need a window of opportunity yes a and that comes you never you never know when yeah. and they need champions so I think you know miles myself and others we were the champions behind this policy 
concept and remain so. It, it will be a, a really viable and exciting policy proposal in some regions and in some countries, and it won't make as much sense in others. So that was sort of my time before Carbon Gap. At Carbon Gap, we did work on a policy in the EU that actually in some ways mirrors the carbon take-back obligation. And this is something called the Net Zero Industry Act, and it was a response to the U.S. Because under, under Biden... The, the industrial uh, IRA. Exactly. They, they put $500 billion towards climate. It was yeah. the greatest mobilization of funds for climate by any government in human history. Yeah. They don't get enough credit for it, in my opinion. Um, the EU panicked. They were like, oh, shoot talented startup founders and are going to go to the U.S. Yes. because all the incentives are there. So um, the EU said, we need to respond. And so they created the Net Zero Industry Act. The idea behind it is, let's reduce the barriers to getting permits and, and building factories in the EU mm -hmm. that can ma manufacture and produce clean technologies. So let's oh. actually reclaim manufacturing of batteries and solar panels and this kind of thing. But hidden within this law, and this is what's so interesting about policy, is you can, you can can get creative. Okay. There's a specific act that obliges the EU to store 50 million tons of CO2 per year, or, or at least to have the injection capacity to store that much CO2 geologically by 2030. Oh. So in five years from now, uh -huh. it, they have to meet this target of 50 million tons per year. And to put that in context, you know, as of a couple of years ago, the total amount of CO2 we were storing geologically globally, mm -hmm. mostly in the US, was on the order of 30 or 40 million tons. Okay. So there's a substantial chunk. Yeah. Um, and guess what? The obligation to do it falls on the oil and gas producers. Oh, that's So great. it basically says if you were digging up oil and gas in the EU mm -hmm. between 2020 and 2023, you now ha carry this responsibility to build this Story. injection capacity. Okay. So it sort of says, you know, who else should build this stuff? You know, I don't know how to build a geological injection well. I bet an oil and gas company does. And, do, yeah. and they've been, you know, profiting from <laughs> these products for ages. So yeah. it's a very clever um, policy which, you know, at Carbon Gap, we fought really hard to kind of keep that and even to strengthen it. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we got some. And we'll be there kind of watching sure that they stick to their commitment. Could be really powerful. It's amazing to see that, like, you're telling this, because when you first told me about Carbon Gap, it was like, it's all about policy. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> like, most of the people will react. It's not that fun. <laughs> but I think you made yeah. this story really compelling. It almost brought us to the journey with you. Um, and you also mentioned communication is really important in climate. It, especially for the job that you're doing carbon gap how do you convey the same message to different group of people like to the general public to policymakers to oil majors to startups it's a great question and and I should say that you know we were talking a lot about some details of policy you know carbon gap also is producing research we have tools like the policy tracker which sort of lets anybody digest quickly what are all the policies in the EU and and what is their relevance to carbon removal so you know we're trying to be relevant and interesting and exciting to the startup community as well. Yeah. yeah, our job ultimately is to distill these this information to make it make sense and to communicate it. It's absolutely the case that you kind of have to meet people where they are when you're communicating. And I don't know that I always succeed in doing that because ultimately you <laughs> communicate what you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and inevitably, I certainly get carried away and excited about the detail. Yeah. But I think one thing I've learned is, you know, we, we've had an opportunity to brief people like members of Ursula von der Leyen's cabinet or, you you know, minister level folks, like like pretty high level folks. And when you're communicating to someone like that, you only have seconds, you have minutes, you have yes. to make every second count. Yes. And I have, you know, amazing colleagues in Brussels that, that we uh, brought onto the Carbon Gap team who are experts at this. They're, they're, they live and breathe the kind of advocacy, the dark arts of lobbying. <laughs> yes. I think it's very interesting, whatever nowadays, when I look into the news about politics or um, advocacy like this, it always made me realize every communication is the same. If you are a startup founder, you only have maybe 10 seconds to talk to an investor. Totally. The, like, how do you draw their attention? At least they're interested enough to to start another conversation mm -hmm. next time. And yeah. everyone has different styles. And I'm, if I'm speaking to a group of, of technologists or startup founders, sometimes I'm trying to help the talent migration, right? We need more people to work in climate. We yeah. need more people to work in carbon management. So sometimes I'm just trying to be interesting and inspiring and make people say, maybe I should leave my banking job and join a carbon startup. Yeah. Other times in with those audiences I'm trying to make the case that 
policy and rules changing and advocacy is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that people I sometimes think I'm in the private sector. My job is to build a startup. So I don't think about policy. I don't think about this. And I think in the, those audiences, I try to kind of change that thinking a little bit. Yeah, you Just, have changed my, my thinking already oh, yeah, to today. <laughs> I have one tough question. How do you meet people in the middle to at least keep everyone engaged in the conversation so then both the oil people and also the climate people can all work together mm. like in a really short way yeah I mean it's easy when you're talking to just one of those groups like I remember having a conversation with a member of the European Young Greens <laughs> okay. and this guy like recorded our conversation and he was like noting down everything to sort of make sure so it, I think if you're just speaking to you know youth activists or you're just speaking to oil and gas folks you can moderate how you're communicating in a way that won't make them close off yeah because that's probably the key in any conversation or communication is like the number one goal is don't lose the channel of communication like you were saying it's yeah. like but when you're talking to a group I mean I think there is a real tension that we shouldn't ignore or shy away from mm -hmm. between big swaths of the environmental community yes and the oil and gas world my feeling is there is a fundamental injury that has been a, a kind of crime that has been committed and there hasn't really been atonement for it so I understand that in other words I'm very much of the view that the expertise in the oil and gas sector, and I often say also that the people and the brains and the knowledge, they happen to work at the oil majors, yeah. but, but they could lead, they could move. In other words, the, we, we can thank the, the oil majors for having developed this expertise on subsurface CO2 storage yeah. and the infrastructure. Yeah. It's not to say that that IP and that human capital has to stay organized the way it currently is in these large corporations. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I think the, the point is that there are segments of the oil and gas world who are moving quickly and, and I I think thoughtfully shifting towards a more kind of carbon management yeah. focused yeah. but that's lost on people and I think the oil and gas community hasn't even come close to doing enough to rebuild or to build I don't think there was ever trust to, to build trust and I think as long as they don't do that the environmental community has a really credible emotional reaction that needs to be it's not just emotional it's emotional and rational reaction that says we can't believe a thing these people are saying. We can't take anything they're saying at face value. So I think there's something, that there's some work that needs to be done. This is sort of a personal point that maybe relates to the Escape 9 to 5. Yeah. Because I remember a couple of years ago, there were huge layoffs at Shell and BP. Like tens of thousands of jobs yeah. were cut. Yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, there's all these really experienced, you know, people, engineers, engineers yeah. and, and business people who are looking for new jobs and, and understandably looking at climate. And mm -hmm. my feeling was like, they were just missing the sort of awareness of we're entering into the climate space that has a lot of mistrust and we have to be open and forthright about not our personal culpability for what oil and gas has done but just acknowledging that okay for decades for decades these companies were you know spending money actively misleading the public creating a, a false sense of of controversy around the validity of anthropogenic climate change you know doing some really long-term damage to public understanding yeah. the least people could do is just acknowledge that and they don't have to take personal responsibility maybe they were working on you know new energies like it's a 70,000 person organization often when you're talking about these companies yeah. it's almost like we could start a course helping people like <laughs> rebrand and, and not just rebrand but like relearn find themselves and find themselves and find out how to communicate because I think I never answered your, your very good question which is like how do you you shift communication to these different audiences yeah. they need to be spoken to in their native language so to speak and yeah. the oil and gas sector was a very insular world with its own language its own values its own mm -hmm. ways of operating and the climate world is its own world and I think people just get lost in translation and don't understand each other and they're they're easily triggered and on both sides yeah. in a way that's really counterproductive I don't want anything I'm saying to take away from the fact that you know we've come a long way but the oil and gas sector is is certainly still not 
on the whole a, a truly constructive partner no. in stopping climate change and frankly that makes sense in a sort of shareholder capitalism dominated world yeah, like why would they but um, I don't think we should sort of wash that away we need yeah. we do need a bit of a reckoning and yeah. I still haven't seen it yeah exactly I think we're all trying our best at, at the same time it's, it's the whole design of the business model it doesn't allow them to or people who work in the like they need a job like what can you do <laughs> talking about carbon gap is there any exciting projects that you're working on now so we're really excited about the new legislative cycle I mean we're oh, who knows what's gonna happen in a few months <laughs> in the US but yeah. you know the UK has a new government the yeah. EU has a new parliament mm -hmm. France obviously just went through an election so yeah. we're entering into a moment where new people are coming into government and maybe not all of their views on carbon dioxide removal are fully formed so I think the most exciting thing we're doing at carbon gap right now is engaging and kind of making the case for carbon dioxide removal with a new political audience uh -huh. and this is a, a fascinating skill that I'm really learning a lot from my colleagues is how do you make the same argument but to a slightly different political persuasion and the reality is you know <laughs> if in one you know for some people they, they care about carbon dioxide removal because it's a means of you know uh, redressing historical emissions for others it's new climate tech it's new jobs in in Europe so that's I think one thing that's really exciting another program that I'm quite excited about is something we call the country readiness uh, reports so we're essentially going country country by country in Europe and doing the really deep analysis to understand what are all the ways that Austria could rem remove and store carbon and build that bottom-up assessment of what are all the different methods what's their potential and what would it look like politically because in some countries the idea of storing co2 in some countries that's actually illegal they would have to reform their their <laughs> laws to even allow that to happen other countries like Denmark are, are much more amenable to it so that's Why quite a, illegal in Germany and Austria I I think there was just quite a lot of opposition from environmental groups and others to the uh, okay. idea of storing CO2 underground and they were able to get a law on the books that said verboten, no CO2 underground. What are you going to do then? Well, in those countries, that will be the first step, is changing that. So there are very um, thoughtful folks in government in both of those countries who are, who are working on that. I think that will be fine. But you know, honestly, it's blue sky. Whereas a couple of years ago, when we were just getting carbon gap off the ground, it was all about how do we build an organization that's able to provide the expertise and the feedback on the existing laws that are coming down the pipeline. <laughs> Here they come, we better scramble and get ready. Now it's a new political cycle. The EU, the EU works on these five-year cycles. Yeah. So we're at the beginning, so we can be a bit more creative, we can be a bit more visionary. We can say, uh, and in fact, a few months ago, we did launch a big piece of work called our call for an EU carbon removal strategy. Mm -hmm. So this, in, in EU speak, this is like, here's a roadmap for all the policies we think need to happen. Yeah. And I'm particularly interested in things like a removal trading system. I think that mm -hmm. carbon removal is is in some ways just cleaning up waste. Yes, I thought about this a lot. Yeah. Everything in climate is just a some way, shape, or form waste management, right? I and it so. and it makes economic sense to make things more efficient, so you don't produce less, or you have a lot of waste and you use that waste to do something else. And then there's carbon man management. My next question is like, what do you see the biggest hurdle in carbon management? Um, globally and what do you think the industry can do to address that? I mean a couple of years ago I would have said the perception that carbon removal is slowing down our progress on emission reductions because if that's the case we should not do it I mean we need to reduce emissions we still haven't peaked in emissions but I think that particular concern is no longer really the biggest hurdle because I think people are realizing that actually most of these carbon removal methods are, are so expensive and, and so nascent that uh, if someone has a choice between paying a air capture company hundreds of euros to remove carbon or insulate their office they're gonna do the cheaper option so yeah. some of that is averted but what's the biggest challenge right now for carbon removal? It's money to motivate that carbon removal. Because to your point about climate being about waste management, there's no reason why somebody would pay to take CO2 out of the air. Yeah. And so this is often sort of shorthand. People say there's no demand for carbon removal. Mm -hmm. I worry about saying that because that sort of presupposes that this is a, a business that people you know, need to be demanding this stuff. And I think it needs to be done through primar primarily government regulation. There's a reason why we can't can't just throw our trash yeah. on the side of the street. <laughs> We've decided as a society that you'll be fined if you do that. Mm -hmm. So then companies rise up 
companies are created whose job is to manage that waste for us. Mm -hmm. And so right now, we've got all these exciting carbon removal companies. And actually, your your company is going to solve this problem, I think, in, it, to some extent. And I'd love to hear more about that because we need actual money flowing in that's buying the service of removing and storing carbon. We have some early contributions from, well, Stripe and, and Microsoft and these large tech companies who have aggregated a couple billion dollars to buy carbon removal. But it's not enough to get these technologies off the ground. Yeah. And we needed so much more. I think all of these things are creating this demand for carbon credit in a way. But at the end of the day, if I'm a startup to remove carbon from the atmosphere, I still need that 5 million or 10 million today to survive for the next five years. So I can deliver your next five years of uh, delivery. So in traditional finance industry, there's this mechanism called securitization. So as long as you have multi-year contractual cash flow, which is mm. exactly what offtake agreement give it to you. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand of the offtake agreement are Microsoft, Stripe, and, and Meta, and all of these high quality cash flow. So people can see an opportunity to invest in these kind of financing vehicles course they can if we can really open up the private credit mm. people in the startup world we always talk about equity everything's about equity but actually traditional finance in like the fixed income world is a much much bigger ticket size there sure. that if we can open that up then once Microsoft and Stripe sign the deal these companies will get automatically the financing then we have a positive cycle to go for the next five to ten years. It's a good idea and I think you're hitting on something really interesting which is like there are these like pockets of the world that are very isolated. Like bigger pools of like more like boring money so to speak. It's not the VCs that are making flashy investments in the latest tech company. No. By the way on that there's a problem where I think everyone wants to think of of new climate de -tech, deep tech companies like carbon removal companies as these massively high re high returning investments that are akin to what you see in like software as a service no. it's not that climate it's not a software problem it's a hardware problem it, at the beginning so we need to use hard, hardware solution to solve it. it which is why you cannot just use traditional vc playbook to see. yeah yeah and i would say it, it's also it's a policy problem in other words like the reason why there are stable revenues for waste incinerators and landfills is because a policy makes it a requirement that people have to dispose of waste safely so i think in the long term where will the revenue come from for direct air capture or enhanced rock weather Mm -hmm. I, I believe it will exist because there's a requirement in certain segments of society to do that. You know, the UK will soon have a sustainable aviation fuel mandate. Mm -hmm. What if that mandate requires that some percentage of the fuel that we're using to fly long haul flights yeah, yeah. is neutralized or reduced through carbon removal? Or if you have to, when you're incinerating waste, capture that carbon and store it, there you go, carbon removal. So it's a bit more, slightly more boring industries like the companies that bring water to us, the water companies, the sewage companies. Mm -hmm. These are profitable, successful, maybe not always so efficiently run, but th these are real large companies. Yeah. Veolia, right? Huge yeah. waste management company. That's probably the future that that will use these carbon removal techs. And so big money, certainly. Big opportunity for project finance, big opportunity for credit and securitization. Not necessarily unicorns with no. thousands and thousands of percent oh. returns. Although I guess a lot of the CDR companies, they're developing the technology. So they could become enormously valuable yeah. because they're licensing the technology yeah. to every municipality across the US. But I think we have to think about the, the end goal. Term. Yeah, in the long term. But speaking about the future though, you mentioned something about the U.S. and also the U.K., you, like uh, Carbon 180 has inspired you. Mm -hmm. Do you see that a future international cooperation could actually become a reality? Because I think a lot of the times when we talk about these projects, it's not just in the U.K., it's not just in the U.S., it's not just in Brazil. Everything is interconnected. And a lot of things about policy and about investor concern is risk from the policy. What, what do you see? It's a brilliant point. because, And I think at Carbon Gap, that's 
100% of what we're doing in a European context mainly. Yeah. So you might have a, a facility in Sweden that's generating carbon that's going to store the carbon in Norway and the carbon credits will be purchased in the Netherlands. You need that collaboration. And one thing we found, one of the most impactful things we do as an organization is bring groups of peers together, right? Startup founders want to start talk to other startup founders. Investors want to learn from their peers and other investors. Same with philanthropists. Guess what? Same with civil servants. Yeah. If you've got a couple people working in the French government mm -hmm. trying to solve the, what should the French government regulations or carbon removal be, and you let them interact with their peers in Switzerland and in the UK, that's actually, those are the kind of peers that they trust. And so I think in a kind of carefully facilitated exchange, we can help create that, that collaboration. But then I think there's an, another point, which is that you can sometimes look at the climate problem and the world at large with all the chaos and the terrible conflicts that are going on, and you can say, this is just pure chaos. Nobody's collaborating. But there's ways in which that's really not true. And, and one of the examples I give is, you know, ambitious regulation in a specific region that changes the whole world outside of that region. Oh, what do you mean? The best example would be in California. You know, California is the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world, yeah. if it were its own country. Yeah. And a while back, they put really high emission standards on cars. So all the global car manufacturers just adjusted their their car and product to meet oh, the California standards. Okay, yeah. And during the Trump administration, they Trump attempted to roll back these or to sort of like overturn California's regulations and the auto manufacturers said we don't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. Even though that would theoretically save us money, we're happy having already pivoted to serve the California market. The, the other markets don't require the same standard, but we'd rather produce one product that yeah, fits, fits the all of these. <laughs> so this is this power, this extraterritorial power that every country has. Mm -hmm. Because if the UK says, you know, we only are going to buy products that meet this climate specification, that makes everyone outside of the UK who wants to serve the UK market mm -hmm. required to make that shift. And this yeah. this is the, the idea of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So this is what the EU will have starting in 2028. What that means is anyone trying to bring a product or a service into the EU uh -huh. will have to pay a fee or pay a carbon price equivalent to what the conditions that are experienced within the EU. Oh. So it's it's a basically a trade wall. It's okay. like a tariff. Yeah. But it's a climate motivated one. So that is a way of kind of enforcing collaboration and cooperation. And then there's some other wild and crazy ideas, which is that just like how back in the day, mm -hmm. the dinosaurs died where they died. And so some countries have lots of oil and some countries don't. You can say the same for other capabilities like CO2 storage yeah. or access to agricultural sector to spread biochar. So different countries will have different natural advantages and disadvantages for different carbon removal methods. And you can foresee a future where countries like Kenya and uh -huh. Iceland, who yeah, have yeah. excellent geology for a certain form of, of kind of low depth CO2 storage, yeah. they might end up taking CO2 from nearby countries or even distant countries. It's sometimes weird when you get a product and you see, oh, it was grown in Argentina and it was canned in Thailand and it reached yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, England. It seems really horrible and you're like, well, that's a lot of food miles. Uh, but the reality is marine shipping is quite efficient from a climate standpoint mm -hmm. on in terms of a CO2 per mile. And so we could end up in a system where we're moving volumes of CO2 quite far distances in order to link the places where CO2 is being produced with the places where CO2 can be stored. I don't know if that will come to be, but it's certainly a possibility. And that is going to require all kinds of collaboration. And we do know that at the international level, there are things like the U.S.'s carbon management challenge that I think 30 plus countries have signed on to, to all mm -hmm. collaborate on carbon management, CCS, CDR. Yeah, yeah. There was another group announced at last COP that was uh, countries interested in negative emissions. So we're also seeing within the IPCC, the intergovernmental coordination groups on the science behind climate, the members, all the countries have actually asked for common standards of different types of CDR. They all said, you know, please IPCC, please scientists, help us have a set of clear rules to certify and measure each type of carbon removal. That came from countries wanting to all have the same rule set. So good signals that cooperation is starting to unfold, even if from a lay person perspective, if you're not deep in, this, in these weeds, and why would you be?
you look at the world and you say, nobody's working together. Everybody's in it for themselves. But actually, there's a lot of collaboration already happening. And even things like the US IRA, which is a little bit provocative, it, it's a bit of a trade war instigator, right? Yeah. It kind of, it gives a lot of incentives to US producers, US companies. It makes China and India and, and a lot of other countries oh, yeah. sit up straight. Yeah. And it might feel a bit adversarial, but I think in the end, it will create cooperation because it will, it will get more countries moving faster. That actually gives me hope. So we were talking about a lot of exciting incentives uh, initiatives around the world because you're in that world. If you can share one really exciting one with all of us. Yeah, maybe I'll do two. Yeah. On the policy side, uh -huh. there's a really exciting policy. Called, it's, well, it's called SB 308 is the kind of technical term. It's in California. Yeah. It's a law that if it goes, if it passes, California will commit itself to buying carbon removal. Like the, the government will be on the hook for, for basically ensuring that that happens. So it could be a pretty world changing, earth shifting policy that other countries and regions can look to and say, okay, this, you know, the time to start supporting carbon removal is now. So that's been an incredible initiative that uh, Chris Nidal with the Open Air Collective has led for years to get that bill over the line. The other one? This is less something that actually exists yet and something that I'm trying to make exist. Okay. So this will be almost my pitch. I'm looking really closely and, and a bunch of folks are getting excited about this idea as well at how can we kind of hijack existing regulation in yep. under the radar and so one example would be wastewater treatment or building demolition these are activities that are very heavily regulated yeah. and you have to think if companies are used to following rules if they're used to saying i got to do my asbestos survey before i demolish a building then they'll be able to follow one more rule that just asks them to do that final step of recarbonating the concrete in the example of concrete waste. So um, we're looking at how do we look not at the big flashy emission trading system or big public procurement program, which are really important and we need to get those over the line. But let's be honest, it's hard to get a big flashy policy that costs a lot of money, especially think about the UK, difficult time yeah. fiscally, not a lot of, of budget to play with. And ultimately what you want to do in policy is you want to find ways to change the rules that are hard to undo and that are resilient if there's a political shift yes. and all of a sudden the next government says, okay, we need some money to give you know more money to the hospital system where can we cut and they see this really expensive policy to purchase carbon removal credits that looks like a, a juicy item to, t to cut so I'm interested in what I'm calling embedded CDR embedding the requirement to remove carbon into something that we already have to do mm -hmm. like wastewater treatment this is a, a so uh, there, there's a whole set of carbon removal methods that rely on al alkalinization of the ocean like spreading yeah. liming and yeah. other agents into the ocean uh, folks are also thinking about doing that in the river systems mm -hmm. anywhere where you, you and a you large body of water yes yeah. and you're using the kind of the geochemical buffer that naturally exists with co2 dissolving into water mm -hmm. uh, to your advantage as long as you can demonstrate that you're not going to have adverse effects with localized increases to alkalinity for ecosystems but generally speaking what are we doing as a society we're burning a bunch of carbon and it's mostly getting pushed into the into the water into the ocean causing ocean acidification mm -hmm. so these are ideas for you know, if we can find sources of zero carbon lime or or other alkaline alk, alkaline materials, that's the trick. Where can how can we do that in a way that's zero carbon in and of itself? But if we can, then we have this massive ability to. to uh, run that acidifying process in reverse and draw extra CO2 out of the air. So I'm quite keen and in interested in these proposals and, and experiments to look at how we can do that in, in river systems. And, and wastewater treatment is, is a really compelling component of rivers because these are places where we're treating our human solid waste before we return that water into the river system. So we're, it's already a controlled environment that's heavily regulated, yeah. that is, is government mediated. And, and so adding additional requirements to, you know, lime the, the, that water before you return it oh. or kind of hijack that existing process. Think about it. And, and this is the real kicker. Instead of carbon credits, which are can be, if it's carbon removal, it could be expensive. You're talking hundreds of British pounds or hundreds of dollars for every ton of CO2. Yeah. That's a lot more expensive than your uncle's forest carbon offset yeah. and there's a reason you're getting a better quality product but it's hard for some people to justify spending that high cost if instead that cost is borne by all of us through a tiny increase in the fee that we pay to the water treatment company 
and it's different in every municipality. Like, I don't even know. I live in Oxford in the UK. I'm <laughs> frankly not even sure how I pay. I think it's through my council tax, but yes. like, it's invisible to me. <laughs> yes. And if that went up by 2% so that they could meet a requirement to remove carbon, I wouldn't even blink. And that's the kind of creative way we have to think about embedding not just carbon removal, but all kinds of beneficial activities for climate. Yeah. We don't just have to put them in big, fancy, high cost policies. We can kind of hide them a little bit. And we have to make sure we do that in a progressive way. It needs to be something that, you know, ultimately costs the average person less than it costs the heavily emitting person. I think we saw that. I know we don't talk about politics on this podcast, but it was really interesting to see Rishi Sunak's speech back in February. Yeah. Well, he basically made the case that Oh, labor, they're going to, you know, climate climate efforts are going to cost you money. Ooh. They're going to put a tax on meat and, you know, ele- the, the costs of electric car infrastructure will make your electricity bills go up and you're paying for your neighbor's solar, solar plant. And it's a really brilliant political argument. I don't think it's a very accurate one because we can decide as a society whether the costs of transitioning to uh, a green future, whether those, we can decide who bears those costs yeah. it could be the average person or it could be the companies and the people with the means to pay for this and that's the trick and I think the Inflation Reduction Act was brilliant politics in the US because you know the average person should they should benefit from this they should get a free air source heat pump they should maybe their utility bills go up a little bit to pay for this but you know there's other costs that we can bring down for them so I think you know the average person needs to feel that they benefit from the climate transition their their energy bills need to go down and and that's what we can do with with solar wind battery storage um, because that's how we'll keep the political willingness to do this and I think the examples I'm giving are saying there are certain regulated activities that people don't really think about and provided that the the cost of the activity doesn't go up too much that's a really uh, yeah. a clever way of funding what we want to do yeah I think a lot of things like the design like a phone right I have no idea how it works within this box so but the brilliant thing about great enterprise or even what you say about the great policies are they make it design really sleek and you just use it and you don't need to know what's happening we, yeah. we as individuals we just want a good life you know sun and blue sky nice weather <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I not too hot I, not too hot um, so like today is perfect I, I hope that you achieve that and at some point that we can come back for another update yeah so if in another life if you get to choose again that you are not doing what you're doing now what would you do like entirely different career path Wow. I mean, maybe I was kind of for a while doing singing and music at a semi-professional level. I, I, I could have I could have become a, uh, you know, b- professional British choral singer uh, singing at Windsor or one of these like churches <laughs> or, or, or doing vocal performance. I think that could be interesting. Yeah, maybe that. Okay. But I think I, I, I would have found my way somehow to, to climb it. Maybe I'd be a lawyer or Sing something. A cop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't yeah. know. Okay, let's go that. Go at lightning round. This is your favorite climate book. Well, this is probably cliche. You've probably heard this before, but I think Ministry for the Future uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson. Oh, I haven't. You haven't? Okay. Oh, um, it's cli-fi, right? It's climate sci-fi climate fiction. And it's a harrowing book because it paints a very near future picture of intense heat waves in India and, and other very severe impacts of climate change that are very plausible, by the way, in the next few years, that when you read it, you really feel like you're there and, and it, it wakes you up. And what he does brilliantly though is he paints a storyline of the next 40 years in which we ultimately win oh. and 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 he shows the the ups and the downs the pitfalls the horrible times and the great times and what's amazing is he's immersed himself so deeply in the things like the UNFCCC and the cop process and that he's actually portrayed something that sounds plausible and accurate to be honest working in that world it's painful to read because it feels so realistic and so much like my daily life oh. but I think to someone who it's a riveting book and it's fun and it's exciting to someone who's not living and breathing climate policy and negotiations every day for them it would just be an absolute page turner yeah and he Kim Stanley Robinson himself is just a really inspiring fascinating guy what's your one productivity hack 
Wow. I wish I had some. I don't know. I think uh, this isn't sort of a hack to make yourself more productive in the moment, but I guess it's about things that, frankly, I don't do a good enough job of, which is like seeking balance in life and finding ways to re rejuvenate and recharge your sort of, in my case, carbon brain. And that means kind of outside of the work environment, finding people and, and situations that give you some new and creative twists on something. Like, you need that constant series of inputs, and if you just put your blinders on and execute and focus on, on your specific work, eventually you're going to run low. Yeah. So I guess it, it's something that I've learned is, yeah, you need that infusion. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask that, that that's maybe the way to unwind, right? Like, mm. what is your, it's like these days watching the Olympics. I really love Simone Biles. Oh, I was like, amazing. she's amazing. It's like, I don't think anyone can just say I quit at that scenario in 2021. And definitely not everyone can just come back and win so many gold medals. But and it shows that how important it is to s say yes to your body, like it's the right time to un unwind. Mm. But what is your favorite trick to unwind then? Well, in Oxford, uh, it's really, you know, it's funny. Growing up, you hear about the River Thames. It sounds like this mythical, strange thing. But in Oxford, it's just this body of water right next to your house, and you can go wild swimming. So oh, I think, really? go, yeah, going for a dip when the water quality is okay <laughs> and uh, getting a little jolt, I think, is really nice. Yeah, yeah there's some. Do cold bath as well? I don't, but I have some friends that are doing that, and I'm wondering if I should get into it. But I'm a, I'm a creature comfort guy. I struggle yes, to be in cold water. But the Thames is just cold enough okay and when i'm home in the u.s i love to swim in the ocean so yes yeah, yeah. jumping in the ocean another question what's okay. the one piece of uh stuff that you bought in the past year like the best one Ooh, like left and right or like speakers like the little you know boom speakers but really? having two that you kind oh, of connect really? yeah so then i got them at a yard sale so then all of a sudden you've got the left sound and the right sound you can put them on opposite sides of the room and you get this immersion oh great yeah it's been good is that amazing yeah best and worst career advice um, the best advice for me was actually from my dad. I remember when I was really young, he, I forget the context, but he kind of said, never be afraid to ask for something. The worst anyone can tell you is no. Mm -hmm. So just this idea of sort of self-advocacy, and that could be in a kind of hard-nosed negotiating context, like, you know, you're negotiating a contract, or it could just be you're trying to reach someone to go on your podcast or to, you know, do a partnership with your NGO. So I think that got me in the mindset of like just ask yeah you know yeah. and don't be afraid to ask and don't be ashamed to ask and I think that I thank him so much because that really uh -huh. I hope kind of I live by that yeah mm -hmm. there's no worse advice well actually kind of the opposite I was speaking to a friend the other day who was part of this really cool UNF triple C climate champions program and, and her supervisor once told her like you know don't reach out to people um, who are you know of a certain stature kind of like don't they're really busy and like m moderate oh. what you ask and I think she and I both realized like that's that's terrible advice yeah. like again you know just go for it just ask you have a question left from the previous guest his question is what does success mean to you I, honestly, for me, I think it's about balance. Like, I think a successful life for me hopefully means I've had a real impact on, on climate. It has to. That's what I'm <laughs> dedicating myself to. Yeah. But on, on a fundamental level, from an escaping nine to five standpoint, none of it matters if you haven't and if I haven't achieved balance where you're optimizing for your whole life, not just for the next year or the next mm -hmm. five years. And that is something, to be honest, struggle with, like actually kind of achieving that balance so that your life can be a full and, and balanced and positive one in the long run. It needs to be. A successful life is, has to be a mi meaningful and balanced life. Leave a question for the next guest. This one's a bit silly, but a friend gave me the thought experiment of, imagine if you had six other copies of yourself. Right. And you can't reveal their existence, so they have to be spread out across different tasks. What do you do? Do you all work together to become one superhuman, or do you divide and conquer and split up? What would you do if you had other copies of yourself? They all have the same capability. But they could diverge and maybe you have the opportunity to send them on different missions okay. and they're all just as unique and self-possessed as you so it could be challenging but what would you do would you even want that that's a question for the next guest if there's a Chinese book called the monkey king 
I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's one of the four no. classics. So it's this uh, monk in China who wants to go to somewhere in India to get this Bible, like not Bible, the Bible in the mm. Buddhism thing. Okay. Uh, and then he doesn't know how to protect himself. So he has three semi-god, semi-marvelish people to protect him, one of which is a monkey king. So the monkey king can diverge a thousand of himself whenever they need to fight. Wow. Just by pulling out of the hair, they, he just needs to blow the hair and then it's gonna be a thousands of wow. himself. But just a fun fact. That's great. <laughs> uh, thank you, this is Eli uh, you, from Lydia. Carbon Gap. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. It was a blast. Thank you, bye. <laughs> yeah, let's, <laughs> let's chill out. Are you ready? Yes. Let me just remember one thing. Right? How do I how do I pronounce your name? Eli. Eli. Exactly. Eli. Yes.